welcome to worship once again with Philadelphia Taylor and Unity United Methodist Churches. It's always wonderful and we're so very thankful that you allow us into your lives for this brief time once each week. So let's join together now and prepare our hearts for worship. Almighty God, we come before you today thankful for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us since last we gathered together. I pray, Lord, your continued blessing upon us. Lord, we ask our, we ask your forgiveness for those times that we failed you, where we have not extended a hand where it was needed or given the kind word where it was so desired. Lord, be with us. Point out with us, point out to us how we fall short of your glory. And Lord, direct us in your ways. We lift up our country and pray for peace in it, for the nations around the world, for farmers who can't get fertilizer, for fuel, for equipment to work in the field and to transport goods. Lord, we're a hurting nation. We're a hurting world right now in many ways because your people don't get along. So Lord, I pray your peace your sense of reason comes to the world leaders and make them bow down before you and work together. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen
Our gospel lesson is Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow, and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing, look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Start over. Hello. Today's message is going to be a little bit different. Um, we are actually, as you see this, are on vacation in Washington State with our daughter Devin and granddaughter Olivia and probably having water wars at some point every day, I would guess. But I wanted to prepare a message for you today and have it ready to go up so that um, we wouldn't miss a, miss a week together. So though the whole service won't be here with all of the components that it usually has, um, I do have thoughts across the miles with you. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to come together. Thank you for time to get away to see family that we don't get to see often and that I am looking so forward to being in the presence of. And Lord, I pray that you get us there and home safely. I also lift up my friends who join in each week and pray that you um, have blessed them since last we were together. And I pray that I thank you for those blessings. And I pray that you forgive us for the many times that we have failed you since last we came gathered in your presence. Be with us now, Lord, as we prepare to worship. And we pray these words as Jesus taught us saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, and may only your words be lifted up today. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. This morning's scripture lesson needs a little background before we start this morning, so uh, let's hear Luke 13, verses one, one through five. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. We don't have a record outside of the Bible about this um, particular incident, but there is a recorded incident from before Jesus's ministry began. Pilate had wanted to build an aqueduct from the pools of Solomon 
to the city of Jerusalem. To pay for it, he demanded money from the temple treasury, and this outraged the people. And when the Jews sent a delegation to beg for their money back, Pilate sent soldiers dressed as common people into the crowd. And at a certain, a certain signal, they took out daggers and attacked the people asking for their money back. This isn't the same cruel act that we just read, but it shows how vicious Pilate was. Killing Galilean Jews on their way to make sacrifices in Jerusalem would be within his character. And in this passage of scripture, Jesus, that I just read, Jesus cites two disasters. One, an evil done by the hand of man, and the other, a natural disaster. You know, it's easy to think of some people as good and some people as bad and believe that God should allow good things to happen to good people and bad things to happen to bad people. How many of you ever heard the statements like Hurricane Katrina was judgment against the sinfulness of New Orleans? Or that AIDS was God's judgment against promiscuity? Jesus says, mm-mm, not so. Unless you repent, you too will all perish. Jesus' point is not that the Galileans in question were innocent. They were simply not guiltier than the others. That wasn't his point. He was, all, he was saying that everyone is guilty. In analyzing the question or that issue, Jesus gets away from the question, why did this happen? and turns it into, why does this happen to me? It means that we all may die at any time, so repentance must be our top priority. Those who died in both instances didn't think that they were going to die that day. Just like the victims of Katrina, or in any, uh, the, the, the shootings at the, in Chicago or the one in uh, at the 4th of July um, parade. Well, that was Chicago, but there was another one too. But those people didn't realize that that day would be their last. In the Greek, Jesus mentions two kinds of repentance. In Luke 13, 5, where he says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. He, de he uses a different Greek word that describes an once and for all repentance. And the verb tense in Luke 13, 3, again, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish, describes a continuing repentance. Jesus is warning here that we all must repent or perish. And in that particular instance where he was making that warning, it, was a, it, it had an immediate chilling fulfillment. Within a generation, those people who lived in Jerusalem, who had not repented and turned back to God, perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Reading the verses in between these first five scriptures and this morning's reading, we learn that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, performing miracles and answering questions about salvation. Jesus continues in spite of a threat from Herod. This is the son of the same Herod that wanted to kill the baby Jesus. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day 
for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. We can't be too sure about Jesus, about the motive behind the Pharisees warnings to Jesus. But we know that there truly are some Pharisees and high ranking Jewish figures who were disciples. Nicol, Nic, Nicodemus and um, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. So why this warning? The consensus among many commentaries seems to presume that there was a collusion between the Pharisees and Herod. Maybe they wanted to drive him, maybe they wanted to drive him away into Pilate's jurisdiction so that Pilate could deal with him, which is what they ultimately ended up doing. And we've already established how cruel Pilate could be. You know, Jesus was coming to them and he was kind of like a rock in their sneaker. Didn't matter what they, how many times they took that shoe off, they couldn't shake him out. They wanted to get rid of him. Whether Herod's threats are real or made up by the Pharisees, we don't know. But Jesus is so unimpressed by Herod's threats that he calls him a fox. The Bible calls the fox a destructive animal. In Song of Solomon 2.15, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. And it's no compliment when Ezekiel compares unfaithful ministers with foxes. O oh, Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Herod, no doubt, had a certain fox-like canineness in his dealings and he lacked integrity. The fox that we face is Satan. We often think it is the big things that come in roaring like a lion, but Satan slips in like a fox. He deceives us and we sin. Jesus makes it clear that he and only he is the master of his destiny. He knows that he isn't destined to die yet. And when his time comes, it will not be by the hands of Herod. He knows that. Therefore, the Pharisees don't need to worry. Jesus knows that on the third day, he will reach his goal. He will be perfected and he will have finished the work God sent him to do. Resurrection will be his. So there he is, and Jesus is mourning the city that will reject him. Verses 34 and 35, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is clearly calling for repentance. He knows full well the destruction and the terror that will come in Jerusalem in about 40 years. He knows the scattering of the people throughout the earth and that their only chance of avoiding that horror is to receive him as he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus takes the focus off the sly fox who is seeking to destroy him and replaces the metaphor with a mother hen gathering her brood to protect them. Of all the animals on the ark, Why did Jesus choose a chicken? He could have chosen the great eagle, as in Exodus, where I bore you upon eagle's wings, or the leopard prowling from Hosea, or a lion, but a chicken? What kind of chance is a hen going to have 
against the likes of a fox like Herod. Drake Caudill shares this memory of his family's chickens. My father wanted my chicken, wanted some chickens. My mother really didn't want chickens running around the yard, but she finally gave in. She found him some game chickens. And about a month after his father brought a few chickens home, he said they had chickens everywhere. They couldn't play outside because of the chickens. And he said they were everywhere fighting. But he noticed that when a storm would come and the rain would start, the little chicks would run to the mama hen and would get under her wings. The hen places great value on those chicks. She actively calls to them. Perhaps the most important about the chicks in this metaphor is what is assumed that these chickens obey instinct. They come to their mother. When the hen calls, they run without hesitation, without delay and without question to the safety that is only found underneath their mother's wings. Jesus is the hen. We are the chicks. We must repent and come home to the shelter of Christ's wings. That is the message today. That is the message in this story. He's telling Jerusalem they must repent. He knows they won't. He knows that they're gonna be scattered to the winds. But Jesus' Holy Spirit is here today and he's asking each one of us to repent. Do we repent and run to the shelter of Jesus' wings? Let us pray. Almighty God, it is Jesus who calls us or the tumult over so much happening in our life and our world today. And Lord, he calls us to repentance. If there is anything that my friends today hearing this or in the weeks to come that hear it, if there is anything that they need to repent of, Lord, I pray that they place it in your care. Seek your forgiveness and ask you to come into their hearts and ask you to be their saviors. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
receive this benediction. Place your hand in the hand of God. Go forth into this world in complete assurance of God's presence and love. Bring hope, healing, and peace. All whom you meet, go in peace, and may God's peace be with you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.